Hello there and welcome once again to Carlton Black Ops King, your friendly neighbourhood ex spook, and another one of my weekly, bi weekly, tri weekly, or whatever I managed to get out vlogs um, of politics and the way things are going and what's happening in the political, geopolitical, and intelligence, secret intelligence, and national security world. So here we are again. The big theme has got to be Brexit, it's got to be uh, Salzburg, it's got to be the fact that the EU has um, basically done what it said it would do from day one. And this is where we need to actually get right into the nitty gritty. The EU has four basic planks to which we have all lived to, and I'm pretty much all you can see, we have all lived to. And all of the 27 other EU states have lived to throughout its life, especially since the coming of Maastricht single market. Uh, by the way, one of the great founders of that being Margaret Thatcher. Okay, so the reality is, is this. Freedom of movement, freedom of people, freedom of goods. Okay, and then over that, this overarching body that says that the EU is, if you will, the nationality, to want of a better word, the nationality of all the states that make up the EU. So these freedoms right, are there because we're part of this union, that's what it is, the European Union, and we're part of it, and that's why the freedoms come. Now, in order to get those freedoms, you have to be a member of this union, which we are, and all the other countries are, and, more importantly, if you're outside, and in things like the European uh, Economic Area, um, you then have to agree to these freedoms, okay? So Switzerland has freedom of movement, freedom of living, uh, freedom of work. Um, uh, uh, Norway has the same freedom of movement, yeah. Basically, if you're part of that union, or even an associate member like Norway and uh, Switzerland are, you adhere to those four pillars. Right. What EU negotiators have said, from day one, those pillars are not negotiable because they are part of what makes members of the club get what they get. If you then want to come off those pillows and have some sort of deal which is lesser and does not give you full access, of course you can. There are many of the countries who trade with the European Union, and by that European Union it means us, because we trade with So all the agreements we have with other countries like China, the US, and we can go on and on and on, I'm not going to, come away from that, but under agreements made with the European Union, in order that you can trade. And you don't get various things because you're not part of the club. Because otherwise, the union, the club. Otherwise, what would be the point of being part of the union of the club? If I put it down to its simplest, which Brexiteers can understand, if you are a member of a golf club, and you go in the following day and you say, listen, I don't want to be a member anymore, but I want to play on the club in exactly the same conditions as members have. I want to bring friends in exactly the same way as members can. I want to tee off whenever I want exactly as members can, but I don't want to pay the membership fee and I don't want to be a member. People have said to you, on your bike. Every one of those Brexiteers have say, on your bike, mate, we're not having you. Well, that's what the UK said it was going to do. The UK said it was going to have everything that we got in the club, but we weren't going to pay for it. And we weren't going to adhere to the club's rules. And one of the biggest things we weren't going to do is we weren't going to have the freedom of movement of people, that is. People can move backwards and forwards. By the way, two million Britons do that and live in other countries. Don't listen to this million figure, it's a lot of nonsense. Two million Britons live in other European Union countries. And again, millions of Britons work in other European Union countries, taking advantage of that process. So why is it that we expect others shouldn't do it in the other direction? The fact that you might sit in Scunthorpe somewhere or down in South End or wherever you might be, and you say, oh, I see all these bloody foreigners here. Why not go to Spain, 
go to Cyprus, go to Malta, go to uh, Italy, go to France, go to, I can keep going but I won't do, and go into a whole load of areas where you'll see British pubs, British clubs, British uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, companies, um, British people living in British enclaves, where, by the way, unlike the foreigners who come to Britain, the Britons don't speak a word of the language, and I mean a word of the language, when you go into the uh, um, uh, health services in these countries, you see a whole lot of Britons, generally older Britons, sat there taking up the health service of the system. Yeah? And you'll see that all taking advantage of this ability to move when we want and live where we want. So why are we different that somehow we can turn around and say, well, we're going to take advantage of it in your countries, but you aren't going to take advantage of it in our country. And let me tell you something else, because I hear this a lot. We are not giving those people any more in those countries, any more than the Polish person is giving to the United Kingdom, or any less. An elderly person living off their pension in Spain is not putting more into the system than a Polish person working in Britain. Indeed, I would argue, the Polish person is putting more into the system because he's paying, or she, are paying taxes in Britain. Because they're young, they're hardly ever using the health service. Whereas you'll see, all people with their ailments are clogging up the health service in uh, 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 Spain. And by the way, just to get this also clear, the health service um, does bill the United Kingdom. But it doesn't bill them for the, sole, uh, for the total amount. What happens is the agreement in the European Union is that we have a, a nominal figure, and I don't know what it is, and I can't remember, I used to know it at one stage, and that nominal figure is exchanged when you take use of the health service. It isn't the hundreds of thousands, if not in some cases millions, that it costs to treat an elderly person uh, who basically... Uh, has a problem with the liver or the heart and they're sitting on a machine in the United Kingdom, uh, in, in, in Spain. Right? So the deal that is, get, is being got by those Britons and by Britain is a better deal. You will see if people cannot afford to live in Spain and they all come back to Britain, you will see a health service that cannot fu function and that cannot work. I was watching a debate just the other day, I'm going to end on this, where uh, a woman in fisheries was talking about how Brexit is going to be fantastic and we're going to take our 200 miles back off the coast. Well, if we take our 200 miles back and the French take their 200 miles back and the Germans take their 200 miles back and the Dutch take their 200 miles back and the Danes take their 200 miles back, where are these British fishing fleets going to, going to fish? Because there isn't 200 miles of distance between them. So where are we going to fish? So we're back to Cod Wars, are we? This is, this is the nonsense of people who don't understand geopolitics, who don't understand what we're living in. She also said, oh, well, we'll sell our fish to China. Who says China wants our fish? She also said some stupidity like um, uh, trading is be international trading is between two people. Nonsense. Nonsense. It shows you absolutely the total lack of knowledge she has on trade. International trade is not between two people, it's between two nations. And in our case, we're going into a nation, trading with a nation block of 27 of the wealthiest nations in the world, and we're trying to cut ourselves out of that process. So it's not between two people. In our case, it's between us and the EU, which is 27 other nations. So even if, the twen even if we take a hit and they take a hit, their hit is split by 27. Our hit is split by one. In other words, the damage to the United Kingdom is one nation's damage. The damage to the EU is 27 nations' damage split in between them. So a fraction of the damage to the United Kingdom that will happen to the United Kingdom. And finally, this same woman made me laugh. She said, oh, well, if we can't get that health care, it's not a problem. And I'm saying her words. Because we'll just get health insurance, because health insurance only costs 12 quid to go and stay in, in, in uh, uh, France or in Spain or wherever. Right, let's get this right. Healthcare is, costs 12 quid because factored into that healthcare is the fact that actually, because you have an EHIC card, or what used to be the E111 card, a card that gives you reciprocal healthcare in the European Union, the insurance companies don't need to pay out. Because frankly, the vast majority of people are treated free of charge in the country. So that healthcare 
they get emergency treatment anyway. That's why it's 12 quid. You will see what it will cost you if and when we leave the EU without a deal and there is no reciprocal health care. That 12 quid to go and get health care in Spain for a week will probably then end up suddenly at, who knows, 300 quid, 400 quid. You know, you try and get it in the United States and see what it costs you. It'll be exactly the same. Right? And don't say, oh, well, they'll have the same problem with us. You're dreaming. Britain is a nation of 63, United Kingdom, of 63 million people. Right? They are over 450 million people. There are 27 nations which we all travel to. They can just say, we won't travel to Britain again. Why would we? Why should we? We've got 27 other countries we can travel to without incurring any duty, without paying okay, when the system changes, without paying exorbitant flight costs, without paying expensive uh, uh, mobile phone costs, because they'll go up, without paying visa costs. You know, our travel industry can plummet. This thing is massive, and I haven't even gone into my area of secret intelligence, national security, and law enforcement, for which we will be hammered by the loss of the uh, information systems that we can now access from other European Union countries. So I'll leave it at that because I've got this new format which I'm only going to knock out five to seven minutes. That's it for today. Listen guys, please get informed about what actually our membership of the European Union means. Do not be fooled by people like Redwood who says it means nothing. Read, get informed, understand what you now have as a member of the European Union. You, individual, British citizen. What you have as a member of the European Union and what you get by being a member of the European Union. Read upon it, understand it. And then, once you've got an informed position, then vote. You know, I'll put it to you. Be brave enough to, to put your hands up and say, I didn't understand what the European Union did for us or what we do within it or what it means. Please put your hand up and say that. And for all the others, finally, on the last point, for all those people turning around saying the European Union has not moved with us, the European Union hasn't moved, so we'll play a hardball. We'll stand and tell them, this is what we're going to do, we're going to pretend. Let me say to you something. For the last 50 years, 40-odd 50 years, the European Union, on people from European Union member states, definitely since uh, the closest of the Union came about rather than the European Economic Community, what has happened is, is that civil servants from the European Union have come and worked in Britain. It's an exchange programme. We are meant to work over there. But because there are not enough British people who speak languages, and believe me, because I'm one of the few people who do speak a lot of the European Union languages, and I'll tell you I was in demand in a lot of places because people don't speak languages. So because there aren't enough, the places were not being taken by British people in European Union countries, but European Union citizens, civil servants, were working in Britain. So they were working to ministers they were working to uh, secretaries of state, i.e. the higher level politicians in Britain. Right? So they understand exactly what the strengths and weaknesses of the United Kingdom are. That's let alone the fact that in Brussels we pooled our sovereignty so they know anyway what the strengths and weaknesses are. So this is not a deal like some sort of business deal whereby you say, oh, we can hide and pretend we're going to do this and that and the other because the European Union know, won't know what we're doing. No, they know exactly what our strengths and weaknesses are. There are no surprises to the European Union about what, how strong the UK is or how weak it is. They know exactly because they've been working in the European, working in Great Britain, right? It's a known quantity. It's a known entity. They know that. Don't let politicians, politicians fool you by saying we're keeping our clouds close to our chest. That's why the European Union, by the way, hasn't found it a problem to say this is what we're going to do because they know Britain knows what the European Union knows. Because British people have been working there in Brussels, not necessarily now within different European Union countries. So the point is, is this. No, you shouldn't be fooled by this idea that it's some sort of negotiation, like as if you were working for a, a normal company and uh, um, uh, uh, you had company secrets that they didn't know. No, they know. So there are no secrets. You know, It's like as if you left your work ten days ago 
and then came back and then somebody said to you, oh, you don't know what's going on, so we've got a lot of secrets you don't know about. It's rubbish. They know exactly what you've got, as you would. So please don't be fooled by this. That's me, out for today. Please subscribe if you and press that little bell below so you get our late, my latest uh, vlogs as they come along. If you think I'm talking a load of rhubarb, come back at me. I love it. We can discuss. All the best. See you next time.